Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I'll remind the people who are not in the room with us that you can uh, send us uh, questions on chat at any point and we'll take a look at those once we get open to get to open discussion. Um, our guest today is Martha Minow, who has taught at Harvard Law School and where she's also served as Dean since 1981. In addition to saving the news, uh, the subtitle of which is why the constitution calls for government action to preserve freedom of, freedom of speech, which is the book we're talking about today. Um, she's the author of when, when Should Law Forgive from 2019, In Brown's Wake, Legacies of America's Constitutional Landmark from 2010, among many other books and articles. She's an expert in human rights and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women children and persons with disabilities. She also writes and teaches about digital communications, democracy, privatization, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. Um, I am Heather Hendershot, Director of, uh, of Graduate Studies and Comparative Media Studies. And um, I work on uh, uh, political media, right-wing media, news media. And I've got a book coming out this latest uh, fall called um, When the News Broke, Chicago 1968 and the polarizing uh, polarization of America. And my last book was on William F. Buckley's firing line. And the one before that was on uh, Cold War right wing broadcasting. So those are the books that I've done that are sort of most relevant, I think, to our discussion today. Um, what we're going to do is take about 45 minutes or so. It's flexible um, for, for Martha and I to go back and forth and, and talk about her book. And I expect she'll do most of the talking because she knows more about her book than I do, but um, I read it with great interest and made a tons of, I'm surrounded by pages with notes on them around me here. So I, I did bring in a few ideas. Um, and then we'll open up for general discussion and, and, and Q&A with the idea of ending uh, somewhere between 6.15 and 6.30. Um, so uh, this uh, book, Saving the News, is... It's uh, a, a tight 150 pages, but I feel like I read a thousand page book because <laughs> there's so much material in it. It's so action packed and, uh, uh, and packed with detail. And um, I encourage you all to procure it and to read it. Um, but I'll just give you the spoiler that there's, there's four chapters and then there's a coda at the end that is almost like an op-ed to just like condense everything from the book into it. So it's a great way to um, get the, the really key ideas of the book before you dive in. Um, and the, the structure is great. You've got two chapters sort of setting up the problem and two chapters setting up the solution and the viability of various solutions. Um, and the, the problem is, uh, is, is laid out as the, you know, the crisis in news right now um, on, on various fronts, on technological fronts, uh, you know, the, the, the crisis of the way that algorithms work, the crisis of the creation of, of echo chambers. Um, and in particular, in the beginning of the book, uh, Martha talks about the um, decline of print journalism and uh, local newspapers in particular. And she emphasizes the firing of staff, layoffs, reduction, you know, uh, and, and, and how this is a, a sort of a, a threat to uh, democracy or rather, you know, how important the, the existence of journalism is to democracy in the US. And in fact, she ends the book dramatically by saying, you know, the constitution calls out, you know, one business, the news business <laughs> explicitly um, because we need news to have a thriving democracy. Um, and then in the second half of the book, she asks, you know, does the First Amendment forbid, permit, or require government support of news industries? How could we find ways to support news industries uh, within the parameters of the First Amendment, which we absolutely can, she argues. Um, and what, you know, what kind of reforms could we make? So I wonder if we don't have to be too rigid, but we could sort of uh, start by taking the book in order and look at that first half about how she lays out the, the problems um, uh, that, that we're facing in the, uh, the crisis, if you will. And um, I'm going to read just one. I'm, I post it. I'm a post-it person. I've got a thousand post-its here and they're all like, read this aloud, read that aloud. Um, and it's really too much. But I, I did mark one passage from uh, early on from page 34 that um, I thought was particularly interesting that I'm going to read to you uh, just to kick it off a little bit. 
I'll give you a sense of the prose style. Um, she writes, the government was once assumed to be the main threat to the, quote, marketplace of ideas through punishments or bans on publication. But now the greater danger comes through overwhelming individuals with messages that swamp meaningful communication. Although, quote, more is better, once seemed a sensible approach to freedom of speech, the more provided by digital resources may destroy professional journalism, undermine public confidence in information, and negatively affect the provision and absorption of information needed for self-government. The current situation differs from prior disruptions because now the very viability of news enterprises of getting local, regional, national, and international news to people is under siege. And you know, the, there's a sense in which, and we can talk more about the scarcity rationale for previous regulation as we, we move forward, but, you know, the rationale for FCC and other kinds of government censor, or not censorship, but regulation used to be uh, the notion of scarcity, that we have a broadcast spectrum that is scarce and has to be allocated, and it's a scarce resource that is owned by the public. And you might say that excess is the new scarcity, in a sense. <laughs> now, there is too much uh, out there, and that this is, um, you know, the flip side, but also a rationale for certain kinds of regulation or action to be taken. Um, so having said that, I wonder, Martha, if you could unpack for us a bit the parameters of the, the, the crisis that you delineate in the book, the problems that you see. Thanks so much. And thanks for the introduction and for the background. I'm a huge Mary Tyler Moore fan. Um, <laughs> so what, what I can say is that there really is a confluence of multiple events that have uh, joined together to create a world in which we have simultaneously uh, decline, shrinkage of the numbers of people who actually make a living uh, as journalists uh, pursuing some kind of fact-based uh, uh, accounts of what's going on or even accountability, investigative journalism, uh, dramatic uh, decline, particularly uh, in the local news um, over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, you know, something like uh, half to two thirds of the numbers of people who made a living as journalists now no longer do. Um, that's one problem. Another problem is the flooding, particularly in digital context, but not only, also in cable and broadcast, of information into people's worlds. Um, but it may not just be information, it's communications, and many of them actually not reliable. Uh, many of them uh, either the product of people deliberately trying to mislead or the product of bots, the problem of, of, of foreign governments, uh, uh, people who are making money simply by creating clickbait. Uh, so that's the second problem that's creating this doubt about the reliability of any information. Uh, uh, the, uh, the RAND Corporation calls it truth decay um, and uh, suspicion about any source. Um, and then there's a third problem, which is the decline of any kind of um, trust in any institution in this country, and in particular, the fragility of democracies in this country, but also in other countries around the world. And it's the confluence of those three that really led me to write this book. Um, the causes of the decline, that first uh, crisis, are multiple. Um, one is the introduction of the internet. Every new technology has jeopardized the press, which as Heather said, is the only private industry that's mentioned in the United States Constitution and not only mentioned, but given its own distinct uh, constitutional protections. So when we move from printing presses to radio, people worried this will be the end, but it certainly was not. Same with television, but it certainly was not. Each time there was a successive creation, we can include Telegraph uh, as well, um, of a new media, it actually opened up more information and more, more desire, more demand for information, sometimes uh, shifting where people get their breaking information from where they get their more detailed background information. But the internet is a little different. Uh, the good news, as everyone knows, is it lowers the barriers to entry. Uh, the costs are low. Um, just, you know, turn over your data. That's about it. Um, but the, the 
difficulty is in the very strength is also the weakness, the elimination of an intermediary or a clear intermediary who is judging whether or not what's being amplified is worth being amplified means that now there can be crazy stuff that's amplified all the time. Uh, and so that's, that's a big problem, but there's a financial dimension to it as well. So the migration of advertising from conventional media to the internet, uh, about 75% of advertising is now that used to be for television or print media is now on the internet and it's escalating even beyond that. And we all know why, it's because there can be the targeted ads. Uh, there can be the sculpting of the message for subgroups. Some people call it digital gerrymandering um, and it's even cheaper. Uh, and that has really kicked out from under conventional media, one of the pillars of its financial model. Another pillar of its financial model also decimated by the internet is the subscription. So subscriptions, why subscribe when you can see someone tweet the headline? Why subscribe when you can see someone cut and paste uh, the results of three months of investigative journalism without charging at all? Um, and, you know, uh, conventional media made a mistake initially thinking, well, we'll just give our stuff away for free uh, and without building a paywall. You know, only the Wall Street jo uh, Journal figured out you start with a paywall. Um, but uh, retroactive clawbacks trying to get some kind of payment for copyrighted material has just totally failed. So that's the second pillar of the traditional finance model uh, for media. So if you don't have subscriptions and you don't have ads, what do you have? Um, and, and yet, and here's just one more piece, most of the print local news uh, is still making money. It's not making the kind of money that lots of investors want. It's not double digits, but it makes money. And that has made it an attractive target for venture capitalists uh, and private equity, which buy up local papers and chains of papers and even radio stations and even television stations, and then proceed to strip mine them for their assets. And that has accelerated the firing and the uh, elimination of actual staff. So you have newspapers that are ghost papers that have no staff and they circulate, you know, uh, features that are written uh, that are very adenine and don't actually pertain to anything about a unique community. Um, and no surprise, subscriptions diminish and ads diminish. So it's a very vicious cycle. So all of that adds up to there's a financial crisis um, for the news industry specifically, but for traditional media generally. Um, you talked about um, late in the book, uh, unbundling and the kind of, uh, you know, once uh, Craigslist appeared and people could get their classifieds online, then they didn't need pay to pay for classifieds in newspapers. But I think another key issue there was that once entertainment content, weather, uh, sports, cooking, yeah. sports become separated out from hard news. Right. Um, I think that the picture there is that those features, and here I'm thinking, like in particular, Matthew Pressman's book on Matthew Pressman's book on press, right, on the, sure. the rise of lifestyle features, sure. a way to make a ton of money and also to support the hard news. And once those things become extrapolated out, and you can get, say, all your cooking articles without right. subsidizing the news reporting, why subsidize the news reporting, right? So. Um, I thought that was just another important angle on this. I don't want to jump too far ahead to solutions because that's, that's later in the book. Later. But that's a great point. And the cross subsidy of the, uh, of the traditional media, um, at, just as you're describing, actually also uh, carried with it another consequence that we're losing, which is serendipity. Bumping into something that wasn't already something you signed up for or that it was targeted based on everything you've seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and that really contributes to polarization. Mm -hmm. The people are seeing entirely different uh, materials uh, and they're not living in the same universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk also about some of the sort of really helpful history lessons that you give in the book to help us understand that the the government subsidizing of the press 
and of, of public utilities and infrastructure in the U.S. is really relevant to thinking about the present, because I don't think most people who think about the crisis in news today are like, what happened with canals, railroads, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, or even like what was ARPANET, you know? So I wonder if you could fill us in on that history and why that's relevant, not just something that history nerds need to know, but like relevant to thinking about the present. Oh, thanks so much. You know, the First Amendment is, is written as if the government just is hands off, uh, that no state shall make a law restricting the freedom of expression or the freedom of the press. But the history, I actually looked for somebody to tell me the history and I couldn't find it. So I had to write it. And I found, you know, a lot of fantastic studies about sub elements, but I tried to put it together. And it is a fascinating story about three ways in which government has underwritten, subsidized or structured communications technologies in the United States from the founding on. The first is uh, actual money subsidies it's from the post office on. The post office is right there in the Constitution. Congress can create a post office. And from the very beginning of the post office, it provided subsidies to newspapers. It created a cheaper rate for their distribution and actually made free the distribution of one newspaper to another newspaper. And that kind of subsidy has continued on into the present. Uh, other areas where direct subsidies exist, we are all familiar with public broadcasting, that's a subsidy. Um, but there, there are others as well. So take, for example, the development of telegraph. You know, the United States government, the Navy was the first purchaser of telegraph uh, machines. Um, and then there are somewhat more subtle forms of government support, for example, uh, the way in which the government actually took land. Government has the power to take private land if it gives compensation. It took land to make it available to telegraph providers to the same way it did for railroads. Um, and of course, it took the licensing power. This is the second way in which the government has structured uh, the media. The licensing power you refer to dealing with the scarcity of signals for radio and then television, but also even for cable, uh, and with a kind of regulatory oversight, restricting the numbers of people so that there won't be too much uh, interference, but also then layering on some public service obligations. So that's the second way, the government structuring markets, regulating then the duties attached to the markets. And the third way is a little more complicated, which is the bundle of rules from antitrust to public utility to other areas where the law actually does a combination of subsidy, structuring markets, creating liabilities, creating immunities. And just as an example, um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is in essence a subsidy to the internet uh, platforms, but not to conventional media because the internet platforms are literally immunized from legal rules that apply to everybody else. Rules against defamation, rules against uh, any other kind of consumer protection violation. Um, and th that makes it cheaper for the internet companies to operate. Um, other examples, as you note, you know, the government very much, this is states and federal government, invested in the creation of uh, an infrastructure during the 19th century and the 20th century. Some of that was communications infrastructure. The internet itself is a perfect example. The Department of Defense paid for the research and the building of ARPANET, which then became the internet. The National Science Foundation gave a grant that led to the very first algorithms of Google. And we can go on and on and on. So the government actually structuring the possibilities, investing in the development of new technologies, regulating the market structure, deciding when to enforce antitrust law and when not to, has all meant that the government's fingerprints are entirely all over the current situation. Um, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I want to 
uh, push back or complicate on one thing and ask you to expand on another thing. Um, the first is that I think throughout the book, when you talk about past regulation that has worked really well in certain ways, um, you tend to paint that regulation in a, in a very positive or benign light. And I think some people would push back against that. I think like when I'm reading your work, I'm thinking about like Robert McChesney writing about the amateur radio movement and how government regulations ultimately like help corporations and help Americans get access to media and so on, but they help corporations by shutting out amateurs, but also help corporations by not letting the Navy have a monopoly say on, on, sure. on radio. Um, and uh, uh, you know, that, that, or, or even the going back further to thinking about like the railroads, like taking land is not a benign thing. Who had that land? Whose land? Right. Whose land? Exactly, exactly. So I wonder if you could um, unpack that a little bit for us. And the 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 second part is um, I'd like to take some more time to talk about Section Two Hundred and Thirty. But I think before I ask you that, I want uh, want you to respond to the first part, and then we can switch uh, a little bit to talk about Section Two Hundred and Thirty. You know, I think a, a very fair criticism of my work is that there's a tendency to glorify parts of the past, which had their own major problems. Uh, even in its heyday, when uh, mainstream media was uh, financially doing very well and uh, was distributed widely, uh, there were real difficulties for the black press there were exclusions uh, for women as journalists, really, until what became known as uh, the yellow journalism. That's when women really broke in and started to do features. And what's called yellow journalism, I think, has to be recast. It's often women going incognito and exposing uh, locked uh, insane asylums and backdoor, uh, backdoor uh, abortions. But in any case, women had been largely excluded from the media. Um, and yes, uh, the, the big companies have always tried to exclude anyone entering, whether it was conventional, um, uh, uh, the, the newspaper owners that would buy up competitors or uh, the, the people who created networks in broadcast and really shut down some alternatives. So all of that's true. Um, there are choices being made. There are choices being made, though, I just want to underscore, not just in these very obvious areas where government is overtly acting. There are choices being made when government is supposedly not acting, because when government's not acting, there are also rules that apply. Mm -hmm. And so all of this is to, to public policy. This is all choices. What do we want? And who's accountable? Um, mm -hmm. To this day, we have large internet platforms that in some ways are begging for regulation, in part because they're subject to competing rules from different states and even different countries, but in part because the big platforms would benefit because um, they could shut out competitors. They have the market capitalization that would allow them to comply. Um, so those are always problems. Um, but having given uh, that uh, acknowledgement, I just want to say it's not like there's an alternative without choices. There will be choices. There's no such thing as natural markets. Uh, the property rights underlying the markets are themselves structured by law and by government. Um, so in that sense, it's what choices and whose choices. Right. The hands may be invisible, but the hands are there, right? <laughs> doing things, making choices. Um, I was thinking about Frank Stanton's line. I think it was Frank Stanton of CBS who at one point said, um, you know, the licenses from the government are like a license to print money and the and the news divisions justify it. And I thought that was, it was a rare moment because usually they just talked about how great their news divisions were, but he was pointing to the fact that the that, that we do public service through the news. And that helps completely right. Uh, the Beverly Hillbillies and whatever we want to put out to to sell ads and 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 to make money, um, and that you know that was like a cynical take on it. At the same time, that there are sort of some good reasons to romanticize that era in news. Um, I think you know for sure. And then the, just add another layer to it. There's this sense that in the past the news divisions um, were so benevolent in serving their public service, in doing public service, performing public service and so on. And they were kind of a lost leader for television when in fact they made quite a bit of money, right? Like Huntley Brinkley took in huge amounts of money 
Um, and what, you know, it, I can't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, they're running five days a week and selling okay. tremendous amounts of ads and, uh, you know, in the short term, bringing in more money than something like gun smoke, which was a blockbuster hit in the long term, they're not because they're not syndicated and that's, you know, the money right. syndication, but just to kind of, um, like we long for that era, but we also need to complicate right. that era, I guess, is what I'm Well, saying. totally right. And, and let's just recall, it, it, it was an era of two and a half networks. Yeah. ABC only went to half the country. So yeah. there was a kind of, you know, a, oligopoly of just a few providers. Yeah. Um, and the model of uh, national networks that then created content that most of the locals carried um, was was uh, a way to make money for sure. Um, but even then the local channels um, could for a brief period make money in the news, but mostly you're right, it was cross subsidy by entertainment. And then we have a wonderful movie broadcast news to tell us about the conflicts about what, can news itself be entertaining and all of those pressures about how do you make news of interest to people? And if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, during very key periods in American history, the very fact that there was such a shortage, such a limited uh, availability of, um, of shared news meant that we had shared experiences. So if there was a national crisis, there was an assassination of a president, everybody could tune in and watch the same uh, funeral. Uh, if there were other events, everyone could tune in and get the same account. That we do not have. We right. do, you, you compare, let's forget the internet, compare Fox News and MSNBC, the overlap in the topics, not just the point of view, the topics is a minority of what they cover. Yeah, and I would also add that in that network era of news, um, I mean, already by the 60s, people were getting more news from TV than from newspapers, right? You see a decline. Um, but I mean, Walter Cronkite himself of CBS News said that the news is a headline service in a way yeah. that when someone wants uh, in the newsroom to sort of poke at him, put up the front page of the New York Times and underline the parts that he could have read aloud on the news. And it was like, a, you know, half the front page of the New York Times. And the point being that like there was 500 more pages that, you know, didn't get covered. Um, and, you know, actually his 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 uh, sign off, he was never really happy with was, you know, and that's the way it is. But he used to in the early days, he signed off by with something like um, and to learn more, read your local newspaper, because the assumption was I'm just giving you like some leads for what is interesting today. And now you should go learn more from the well, page. And, and interesting that's kind of coming back with podcasts so that people can actually dive deeper mm -hmm. behind the headlines uh and those uh outlets that are succeeding are finding that the viewership on podcasts is going way up the only problem is no one's figured out how to make any money on a podcast um let's uh i i i previewed that i wanted to talk about the um section 230 of the of the communications decency act and uh, I wonder if you could unpack that for us a little bit. And 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 your book is um, uh, it, it it's very concerned. You express a lot of concern about this uh, protection from liability that Section two hundred and thirty allows. Um, and then you know on the flip side, there are various kinds of political positions from which people speak who would like to eliminate 230. And some of it, as you point out in the book, like at one point Trump was saying, we got to get rid of this yet. And it showed a complete misunderstanding of what it actually meant, which is no surprise at all, right? He didn't really get it. Um, but then you have, I mean, well, you just have competing voices who would like to eliminate. And I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. And and also concerns about what it would mean to get rid of it, for example, in terms of citizen journalism, in terms of, I mean, what if, uh, if you if uh, you eliminate Section 230 and then platforms decide, well, we're not going to show videos of any kind of uh, police officers because we may get uh, in legal trouble for that. We're liable. And therefore, if someone has footage of police brutality, police violence, we we will choose not to show it because it's it's the safer choice. And I think that. Um, I, I've seen a number of op-eds saying, you know, the the uh, awareness about George Floyd's murder, for example, sprang from 
people being able to post this this horrific video as evidence that this thing happened and that if if platforms were liable, that video never would have been allowed. And that may or may not be an, a, an overstatement, but I'd like to hear your take on, on that angle. So thanks. Uh, when the Communications Decency was act, uh, enacted, which is where Section 230 uh, was created, the internet was a fledgling entity. It was barely in existence. And the concern that the legislators had was how to shield this vulnerable new technology from the competition from the behemoth large broadcasters and others. And so this immunity was invented as a way to create a space where there wouldn't be the kinds of liabilities, if you will, that attach to mature actors, adult organizations in the world that are responsible for their actions. Uh, newspapers haven't shut down in the face of defamation actions. Uh, and so the idea that now the largest uh, companies in the world, the most profitable companies in the world, the very large internet platforms would be jeopardized by facing the same liabilities that now their puny rivals face is kind of laughable. Um, and yet, of course, it's you know very convenient for the internet companies to claim that uh, they still need this protection. L but let's be clear, I'm not necessarily arguing for eliminating it. I'm arguing for modifying it, perhaps by using it as a way, if it's so attractive to the large companies, to make it conditioned on some public duties. You can still have your immunity if you have some public service obligations that you also have to fulfill. Um, but now I have to do a little Constitutional Law 101. Uh, a lot of the people who have argued um, from the Trump perspective to eliminate Section 230 are confused about the First Amendment and say that when there's a deep platforming of someone, say, Donald Trump, that that's a violation of the First Amendment. Constitutional Law 101, private actors do not violate the First Amendment. The First Amendment restricts the action of government. No state shall make a law. Uh, and therefore, there is no First Amendment issue if there is moderation, if there is a decision about who can uh, amplify their voice and who can't. Uh, Con Law 102, uh, the right to speak is not the right to be amplified. There is no right to have your voice go for free to everyone in the world. Um, and Con Law 103 uh, is that, in fact, the internet uh, sir, uh, platforms, just like the newspapers, just like the media networks, they have First Amendment rights. Their First Amendment rights include editing. They include the choices about what to show, what to amplify, when and where. Those are protected by the Constitution. So the debate about Section 230 has been distorted by people who don't know constitutional law. Um, there are, uh, last count, something like two dozen bills that have been introduced into Congress to alter, modify, or eliminate Section 230. But we could put aside about half of them for this mistaken view. Moreover, they, they themselves would violate the Constitution because they then are government action. Government action calling for there should only be uh, material that shows the following, or there should be no material that shows the following. That violates the First Amendment. So mm -hmm. what's left are a variety of actions, uh, proposals, some of which are the kind that I'm in favor of, that would put some uh, quid pro quo. You want this immunity? Then in exchange, there's some duties that attach, like responsible moderation, mm -hmm. or like opening up the layer of uh, internet platforms that does moderation to competition or making transparent the criteria by which moderation uh, is performed, none of which are currently required. Mm -hmm. So if you think about basic consumer protection law, which is also not applicable because of section 230, if we were in any other industry, there'd be obligations to disclose the contents, to disclose the practices, to comply with the service terms of service agreements that the companies don't even comply with their own terms of service agreements because they're allowed to say this can change at any time. So just basic responsible action.
that we apply to adults who run companies, I think could attach to these internet uh, platforms. And I like the idea of making a quid pro quo. They want some immunities and there should be some duties. Yeah, I understand that argument about the quid pro quo and also um, what you're saying about basic misunderstandings of what the First Amendment is, is like um, very useful context because it needs to be said. Um, part of what I was uh, getting at was, would be with the elimination of Section 230. And I don't know if this would be relevant with a modification or a quid pro quo kind of situation with Section 230. But I was also just, you know, asking if there could be a chilling effect on, on speech. Because unlike in the newspapers, newspapers don't just put out what a bunch of people who don't work for the newspaper say in the way that platforms let anyone come in and, and say their stuff. So, you know, would citizen journalism be basically kaput because if a company is like, yeah, we're going to censor this out because we don't want to deal with liability issues, does that mean that you, we don't see someone's uh, video footage of being pulled over um, by a police well, officer? I'm a little perplexed about what exactly is the liability. So, so the police officer is going to sue saying that this is defaming me, um, but truth is a defense to a defamation action. And the fact that it, it, it there is uh, video footage, it might be, in fact, useful against deep fakes, where mm -hmm. it's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. But if it actually happened, that's that's not going to produce liability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess um, I'm thinking not. I'm thinking about preemptively people just being like, well, you know, in a way, it's like with the fairness doctrine, where technically the fairness doctrine said broadcasters are obliged to cover controversial issues of public importance. And when they do so, they are obliged to cover, you know, give both sides multiple points of view. Right. And so when they did cover controversial issues, they showed both sides um, or tried to or most often did found a way to balance out the coverage, at least over the course of their schedule. Um, but one effect was sometimes a, that a, an avoidance of showing controversial issues of public importance, and especially on the local level, I would say more than the national level. Let's right. just not even get into this this crisis because it's controversial. It's yeah. too much work for us. And so I'm and so there is I, I think the fairness doctor was well intentioned. It had some flaws, but it did sometimes have a chilling effect on speech. And I'm just wondering if adjustments to Section 230 might also have a chilling effect on speech, regardless of the fact that it shouldn't because defamation, you know, if you show a crime, it's not defamation, right. it's evidence not of a crime. It shouldn't work that way. But if platforms decide, well, we'd rather not take any chances, then you have that sort of chilling effect. So I get the question. And yes, the fairness doctrine in particular did lead uh, some mainstream broadcasters to say, we want to stay out of this because we don't want to even figure out what are the competing points of view, mm -hmm. which was in tension with their obligation to cover uh, issues of importance. So it was really up to the enforcement uh, will of the Federal Communications Commission, whether or not they actually demanded uh, compliance with both of those duties. And, and that varied depending on the administration. Um, but I don't think that's the issue uh, that's presented. Those dynamics are not presented uh, with Section 230. Or maybe more a better way to put it is we have the lessons of the misapplications and negative effects of the fairness doctrine that should guide any revisions of Section 230. We can learn from experience. Mm -hmm. And I just want to underscore again that the platform companies currently edit, they moderate, they do all the time. They take down all the time. Um, and that's not the question. The question is what incentives do they have and, and uh, whether the, we can learn in fact from their compliance with the copyright laws. Mm -hmm. So we can create a safe harbor that they can allow third parties to post anything until someone objects because it's a copyright violation. And if they take it down, they don't face a liability. Mm -hmm. So there could be a similar kinds of approaches towards material where there's a borderline question. Yeah, I appreciate that notion that like, let's learn from the fairness doctrine where it succeeded, where it failed and kind of apply that moving forward. And also I think a lot of liberals and progressives point to the fairness doctrine and say, if we could just get that back, we'd fix all of our problems. And your book notably does not do that. And in fact, I didn't, uh, if I had a PDF and could have done a search like FCC versus FTC, I feel like the FTC comes up more than the FCC and that you're, you're thinking about like consumer protection. Yeah. 
be an FTC model more than an FCC model. And I wonder, and this takes us into solutions even more, the second half of the book, if you could talk about what that means to use a consumer protection model and what role the FTC could play in, in uh, reforms, changes, whatever um, uh, Great. you're advocating. Well, thanks. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission versus the Federal Communications Commission. And of course, there are state counterparts, consumer protection and also regulation of uh, media at the state level and even localities. You think about the local cable monopoly. The local governments have a role to play here that they have not exercised and could actually be much more vigorous in requiring public service dimensions when they award a monopoly to a cable provider. So three buckets of solutions are what I propose, none of which alone will solve this problem. And even all together, they're not gonna solve the problem, but I think that they could make some dent in the problem. Uh, the first bucket um, is to, as I've already been suggesting, to hold the internet companies, the large platforms responsible for their actions as if they were adult companies. And there are several areas uh, copyright enforcement, I would go further than the current takedown practices and require payments for the uh, circulation of copyrighted material. Uh, Australia required Facebook to actually pay when a third party posts copyrighted material. And initially Facebook said, then we're leaving. And a week later they came back. Mm. Uh, the European Union has similarly said copyrighted material that's circulating on social media um, there's a virtuous circle that's supposed to be represented by copyright that then protects the time and energy of those who developed these stories so that they can then go and report a new one. If a third party can just distribute it without any payment, there goes the possibility of new uh, investment and new reporting. So that's another example. Um, uh, we've talked about Section 230. Uh, and yes, uh, I do think that there are uh, other kinds of responsible actions, including um, actually uh, making, making uh, child safe zones. I mean, there's ways you could design portions of the internet that are safe um, or are better for uh, different kinds of viewers. D disclosure about what uh, are the practices that they're using, as I've already mentioned, would be another. The second bucket, are um, ways in which the government regulation could strengthen uh, the news industry, whether it's digital or con uh, not digital, um, by actually uh, developing uh, antitrust exceptions, for example. Mm -hmm. So if local news providers were exempted from antitrust problems, they could collaborate around back office expenses. They could collaborate uh, even in doing investigative journalism. You think about the model of ProPublica, which is a national organization, but it invests in, for example, building a big database about which doctors are abusively using their prescription powers in the opioid area. And they make that database available to local news providers who then can write a local story. If you think about similar kinds of commons that can be created, the Associated Press is another example. Um, where Can we bring that up to date for the internet age? That required uh, construct, uh, interpretation of the antitrust law um, so that the Associated Press could not exclude uh, new participants in it. So in order to maintain the small players, allow different kinds of aggregation and collaborations. Uh, another uh, aspect in this bucket of the laws that govern conventional media um, uh, and also the internet would be privacy laws, consumer protection laws that could apply to the internet companies. And how about protecting our data? So that when we um, supposedly are getting these internet services for free, um, that maybe we get paid or at least we get some kind of disclosure or something like that. The third bucket is direct subsidy uh, plus uh, public education, uh, critical media education, everybody coming to MIT or elsewhere, um, but also uh, uh, direct subsidies like public broadcast. Why can't we have a public internet that has public service duties? 
Um, why can't we actually have even more uh, investment in public media? It has to be carefully separated from any content decisions. So it's not the government making uh, those choices. I should disclose I'm on the board of uh, uh, WGBH here in Boston, and which is very mindful of that and tries to have plural sources of funding. Um, but another kind of subsidy that I think could take even more importance is recognizing um, the role of the tax code. So the role of the tax code in uh, giving uh, tax credits, for example, to advertisers who pay for ads in local outlets, for taxpayers who subscribe to a news service, there could be a tax credit. That those are elements of the currently pending uh, Local News Sustainability Act, which actually has bipartisan support. Joe Manchin supports it. Kristen Cinema supports it. Because if you're a politician, you know you need local news. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another kind of subsidy in that tax area is actually the whole area of nonprofits. So a nonprofit organization is subsidized indirectly by the government by the fact that it is not taxed. And donations to it produce tax benefits to the donator. Those are ways in which the government can boost nonprofit organizations. And I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing conversions of some news outlets from the for, from the for profit to the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, we just saw that happen in my hometown, Chicago, where a radio station merged with a for profit newspaper to become a nonprofit, to share their back office and their digital services, but also to have the benefits of this tax status to be able to get foundation grants and other kinds of grants. So I think that those are examples of subsidy and I'm sure that there are others. Critical media education I do think is really important so that uh, digital natives above all uh, learn to assess where's this coming from? Uh, if there's no name attached to it, why do I trust it? Um, and, and how do I understand what I'm seeing and what I'm not seeing? Yeah, one of the points in the book where I got the most excited, I never thought I'd be so excited about learning more about the tax code. And but, but when you're at the end and you're talking more about 501c3s and this as a, as a venue for journalism, I thought this is, uh, this is quite brilliant. This is like a really clear sort of roadmap for a certain kind of change that could really help, you know, tax breaks for say, making more hires to a local news source, yes. that kind of thing. Um, and your point about politicians needing local news, I think, um, is is a good one. And I, I think the sort of flip side to that is like C-SPAN uh, years ago being invented in part as a venue for politicians who want to be seen more outside of the so-called filter. They don't want to be edited. They just want a camera in the room. They want to be seen. And uh, local news um, as something that could be boosted at the other end of the spectrum, like C-SPAN was, you know, years ago, um, could be a, a sort of path forward. Um, I, I'm going to ask you one last question then, and then I see we've got some questions in the room and I want to open it up. Um, but create, make it, transforming your local newspaper into 501c3 is quite doable. You can look up how to do that. That can happen. People can innovate from the bottom up to make that happen uh, in the same way that say uh, art movie theaters could be totally destroyed right. if they didn't become 501c3s. It's the only way forward for them at this point, right? There are other kinds of- venues. Support the Brattle Theater, absolutely. That was my next thing, support the Brattle. <laughs> That's the only way forward for so many venues now is going to be seeking 501c3 status. They, they, you know, they need it. So I see a clear, exact sort of how that would work. There are other parts of what you call for that I see how they would work in theory, but then I'm like, well, given the way Congress is right now, given the, the far right takeover of the Republican party, how can we make any of these ch changes happen? Um, is, it, is it, you know, are there, you, you, you've listed your, your uh, sort of bucket list here, you know, your list of one, two, three, right? So what are the practical steps forward to actually enact these things? Is it about legislation? Is it about, you know, what are the different levels that would have to be in play to make some of these changes really happen? You know, it would be great to improve the government generally, but in the world that we currently live in, 
Uh, one approach, as I've already suggested, is to find those topics where there is bipartisan support, and there surprisingly is a fair amount in this area. And that even includes uh, expanding the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and there's interest in doing that. So there's legislation that's possible, but there's also administrative action. And if you elect a president who appoints someone to run the Federal Trade Commission who cares about these things, then the Federal Trade Commission can actually shift its resources to this area, mm -hmm. uh, enact regulations, use its subsidy powers, which it has, use its investigative powers. They already have those powers. It's a question about, is that a priority? Similarly, elect a president who actually cares about the antitrust laws and wants to enforce them. Uh, and makes appointments to the Department of Justice, Antitrust Division, and the Federal Trade Commission of people who actually believe that the antitrust law applies to the large internet companies. Um, a, a, another thing that's possible, though, is to recognize state governments. State governments are currently considering some of these subsidies using state taxation. Uh, for the nonprofit news and even the for-profit news. Lo uh, Local News Sustainability Act versions have been introduced in several states. And I have a group of students who are working on having it introduced in Massachusetts. Um, in addition, fascinatingly, this is kind of a, a, a pool bank shot. If there are a couple of states that start to regulate, guess what? The large internet platforms and the large broadcasters will go to Congress and say, please, would you legislate because we are subject to these competing rules in different states. So actually there's a lot that can be done uh, to motivate Congress or to work with other actors. Um, I do think that philanthropy matters a lot for my third bucket. Um, and, uh, th the, and I think that universities have a role to play. You know, in many states in the country right now, if you go to the state capitol, the only journalist who is covering what is going on is a university or high school journalist. Mm -hmm. There have been serious proposals that local news actually now is in many places a function of colleges and universities. Well, if so, then let's actually support it. Um, it will require philanthropy, it may require public dollars, but if that's the only place that's actually covering the legislation that's being debated or the corruption that's not being exposed, there should be some, some uh, public uh, commitment uh, to cover it. You know, we have evidence that those communities that lose local journalism have it, notable measurable increases in corruption, corruption by the government, and corruption by private actors. Um, Flint, Michigan, I am so haunted by the story of Flint, Michigan and the lead in the waters. And I talked to the public health official there who said, well, actually we were lucky. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we were lucky. We had really good local journalism. And then she said this sentence that I still can't get out of my mind. She said, we have hundreds of Flint, Michigans in the United States, but there's no one covering it. Hmm. So I think that there are lots of steps that can be uh, pursued, public actors, private actors. Um, you know, you talk about citizen journalism. I think one of the interesting possibilities is how um, new platforms can be created where citizen journalism can be amplified. That's great. That's very helpful. And it's very, just really specific. I appreciate that. And, and I just was going to add as a side note, like, the, the college and university point I think is so important. And it also makes me think about radio and how radio has, it hasn't died. People are making millions of dollars on it, right? But you know, you, you a local radio station is not local in any way. There's a pre-programmed right. playlist. The local DJ just might say words between the songs that he or she has been told to play. Whereas college radio is where people actually make yes. programming decisions and could potentially be doing say local reporting, not Absolutely. playing, uh, Un unusual music, you know? So I think that, that pointing to college radio is another uh, good example. Um, I wanna switch to, uh, we can have some questions from people whose faces we can see for sure, but uh, we also have some in the, the Q&A here. Um, there's one here from Ed Bershinger. Uh, the right wing loves to cite Justice Brandeis, 
saying that we need more speech, not less. Many right-wing pundits are also originalists. As I understand it, Justice Brandeis was not an originalist. Consistency may be too much to ask, but is there an effective response to those who insist on free speech above all other rights? If consistency mattered, we would have a very different kind of uh, jurisprudence. You know, we have uh, conservatives who claim to be originalists until they're not. Um, so the what I tell my students all the time is we just have to know how to speak all of these dialects. And, and it is possible to make arguments about speech as an originalist, as a pragmatist, uh, as a structuralist, all the different methods. Um, what I think is probably um, most uh, valuable here is actually to point to Justice Brandeis's own uh, beliefs uh, in the market, but in a regulated market. Mm -hmm. um, and to identify the ways in which um, he and others on the court um, showed that uh, you need a regulation in order to have freedom. And that's true about free speech. If people really want to be originalists, the most amazing thing is that the First Amendment would not apply uh, to the states. Um, uh, the First Amendment actually says Congress shall make no law. So it wasn't until the Civil War and the Civil War Amendments um, that were enacted that, uh, and then gradual decisions over the course of the 20th century that the courts decided to apply the First Amendment to the states. The originals had no idea that this was gonna happen. This is all judge made law. And I would just go a little bit further and say the creation of protection for commercial speech, that's something that courts invented. The press is what was protected. Uh, the definition that speech applies to any digital communication, including an algorithm, that's not in the constitution. That's judges who are making the decision. These are therefore decisions that can be argued with and uh, debated. Thank you. Um, TL, I see your hand is up. Hopefully my, hopefully my internet is still working good enough. Thanks for a really um, interesting talk and conversation points. I, I found the, the um, the comment in the work uh, of thinking about the FTC rather than the FCC really interesting way in. And it, it made me, it reminded me of um, Danielle Citron was kind of trying to get folks to reframe thinking about harm in cyberspace as civil rights violations. And I, I as somebody who works in kind of internet studies, I found that a really generative move, really useful. So my question is sort of, are there other existing levers or rubrics or legal frameworks that might also, you know, to add to the pile of come at it this other way, that's going to get us into the interesting productive terrain. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. And for a shout out to Danielle Citron, whose work is so terrific. I'm a huge fan. Uh, she has a new book coming out very soon. Um, what I can say, uh, I'm sure that there are many, but one that comes immediately to my mind is public utilities. So the idea that um, there are some goods that are so necessary that the, and yet the structure of the markets are such that they're so capital intensive that they won't produce real competition. So people have to buy water, have to buy electricity, have to buy phone service, and there isn't real competition. That led to the creation of this idea of a public utility, privately owned, but public duties. So yes, you can go ahead and take advantage of your market position, but only if you make sure that your service is universal, you do not discriminate on the basis of fill in the blank, et cetera, et cetera. Public utility is a framework that I believe could be applied to the big internet platforms. And they would remain private, they could make scads of money, but they'd have duties. 
Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I just I got me thinking about the Rural Electrification Administration and how after World War II, they basically decide phone service is not a luxury. It's not just for business right. and or for urban people. How can we get phones everywhere? Everywhere. Phones in rural America because it's it's a public utility. It's not just. A, right. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, his project, and it came from being a school teacher in Texas and seeing what people's lives were like. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking about Robert Caro's yes. <laughs> opus and how one of the big stories is is Johnson getting electricity back to you know his absolutely people, how that made him like just getting electricity right yeah made his career in certain ways. Um, there's two. Uh, uh, questions here that are um, somewhat historical from Suzanne Singer. One is, you know, why not bring back a modified fairness doctrine? And this might be a good chance for you to talk about what you call at one point, I think, the awareness doctrine uh, yeah. in the book. Um, and the other question also from Suzanne Singer was, what about antitrust legislation that used to be enforced, i.e. how many TV stations and other media one company can own in one market, which is something that is quite relevant to the book, That, may, but maybe we haven't hit on it yet. Great, two, two wonderful comments and questions. Um, let me say something about antitrust first and then go to the fairness doctrine. So the antitrust law is another you know, era of Louis Brandeis, um, the recognition that uh, large corporations actually can exercise power of the sort that um, uh, concentrated governmental power uh, jeopardizes personal freedom and democracy. And the a progressive era produced the very first antitrust laws and the idea that actually private power can jeopardize democracy. Fast forward to the 1970s, University of Chicago uh, economists developed an idea that the antitrust law shouldn't actually be concerned with democracy. It should only be concerned with consumer prices. It shouldn't be concerned with concentrated uh, wealth or concentration of uh, market power. It should only look at are the consumers having a cheaper price. They were successful without even changing the legislation. Their theory was adopted by judges who interpreted the law and prosecutors who interpreted the law. Apply it to the internet. There are no prices. And so the idea that there's any check on is there too much being charged or not being charged, it's one reason there's been so little antitrust action with regard to the internet. Well, there are currently uh, uh, now a bunch of people are saying, let's go back to the original idea about antitrust. The concentrated private power is a problem, uh, that it's a problem for democracy, it's a problem for markets. And then there's some people actually suggesting that uh, the internet is not for free. We are giving over our data. We just need to be a little bit more imaginative to understand what a price is. And then we could actually regulate here. Mm -hmm. So Lena Khan, who's now you know, at the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, Tim Wu, who's in the White House. These are people who believe what I've just described. Whether there will be action or political will, I don't know. But it just goes to show that uh, antitrust remains a viable tool if we have the political will and the legal uh, enforcement. Uh, if it doesn't happen at the national level, it could happen at the state level. Antitrust is a power of state governments as well. Um, fairness doctrine. Well, as Heather said before, the justification for the fairness doctrine was predicated on the scarcity of the signal that in order to get a license to operate a radio or a television station, uh, an applicant had to promise to fulfill certain duties. And one of the duties was to provide coverage of controversial subjects, coverage of local news, and uh, a fair sampling of competing viewpoints. We don't have a scarcity rationale for that kind of regulation when we're dealing with the internet, nor with newspapers. Those kinds of issues uh, about fairness and competing points of view have never, never applied to those outlets for that very reason. Uh, the Fairness Doctrine was upheld legally in the Supreme Court um, because of this anomaly, this unusual circumstance. 
Um, but it's an exception to the usual rule that editors have free speech rights, that viewpoint uh, is itself protected. Uh, and therefore, um, the editorial judgment uh, by a, uh, uh, a, a internet platform, by a newspaper, by a cable uh, is actually protected by the First Amendment. As you have written about, Heather, uh, the talk radio uh, and the development of right wing media is all about the First Amendment. Um, and uh, the, it, there's not any constitutional way. And I, I'd be worried about someone coming up with one that would force um, Fox News actually to have competing viewpoints. Um, also, it might actually make people think that they're really doing that because they're not. Um, but in any case, um, I think that the Fairness Doctrine also faced a political demise. Uh, the big broadcasters in particular organized even after the Supreme Court victory um, and it lost the political support. And so ultimately, uh, under the Reagan administration, uh, it was really disconnected and it really took a while to the Clinton administration for it to go off the books. Finally, the FCC eliminated it altogether. I had a student, though, in, uh, who responded to my telling of this history who said, well, why can't we have an awareness doctrine? And I love this idea and I give him credit in the book. And uh, the way that I've tried to flesh it out is how about a doctrine that simply requires the disclosure of the parameters being used for moderation of content on an internet platform. Um, or to go a little bit more affirmatively, um, to give an option to people to actually elect to see information that is different than what their preferences would amplify. So a group of undergraduates at the University of Chicago in one semester for a class project came up with something that they called flip side using uh, you know, algorithmic tools, machine learning to study content, to be able really cheaply to identify competing viewpoints in publicly available media uh, about various topics. Now, I have no disrespect for undergraduates at the University of Chicago, but if they could come up with that in one semester, imagine what the genius engineers at Meta, at Twitter, could come up with. If we really actually uh, required or maybe even just gave incentives for them to come up with awareness techniques for their users to actually find ways to have serendipity, to encounter um, content that's not just amplifying what they um, have looked at before. I love that example of flip side from your, from your book and um you know, the, the, just the kind of the way that these students found a way to, I mean, it seems to me all about the interface. Like you can't just be like, it can't be like click, click, click. I mean, you make the point in your book that it would take the average person 250 hours per year to uh, 20, 250 hours each year to each read year. everything they click off on that they're agreeing to like terms yeah. of, you know, yeah, this, 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 right. Because nobody reads that stuff. So you'd have to find a system where people, um, actually want to engage with the choices that they're making about how their data is being shared and what's being shown to them. And right. so, um, the other thing I wanted to add was um, about the, the history of the fairness doctrine in its fall is that when it was starting to kind of teeter, one thing that I find really interesting is that there were so many conservative and right wing groups that actually wanted to keep it. Whereas yeah. now they, you know, they, they call it the hush rush law. Everyone was trying to make Rush Limbaugh shut up by bringing it back. But, you know, Phyllis Schlafly was in support of the fairness. Yeah. doctrine. The NRA supported the fairness doctrine because they're like, if people are going to go out there and attack us, we need a legal way to attack. Respond. That. And exactly. Right of reply. Well, you know, we used to have people supporting democracy in elections also. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, yikes. Yeah. Um, we have a question from one of our graduate students that's uh, in the, the 
Q&A area over here. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Thomas, uh, Tomas Guarna from CMS here. The note on Section 230 as subsidy and public investment in early internet infrastructure is extremely interesting. It does seem like this public investment ended about 20 years ago, and today it would maybe be unlikely that 230 were passed. Do you see a change here in how the U.S. government invests in communicative infrastructure, and how would you make sense of it? Wow, very interesting. You know, I, I don't have access to the defense budget, but the Defense Department still is investing dramatically in infrastructure that includes communications infrastructure. And remember, the internet itself was a, a DARPA project. Um, and the, uh, the boost to the telegraph um, came from uh, national security concerns. Um, and so I, I, I think there might well be uh, investments that I'm just not aware of. Um, but I agree, we have had kind of a falling off of what was the big tradition in the United States, 19th century, especially early 20th century, especially, but 1950s, 1960s, government priming the pump by investing in infrastructure. You know, to some extent, that's been the argument of uh, the Biden administration, not to get partisan about it, but a build back better is to invest in the infrastructure, to invest in roads and bridges. And you know, a big part of that bill is broadband. There's a whole internet portion, a very serious commitment about tech investment. Um, so there just at the moment is a political logjam. Um, why has that fallen off? Well, we've had you know about 30, 40 years of an attack on government with the claim that it's not effective. And it's not, it's not uh, an efficient way uh, to allocate resources. What's really striking is the United States is likely to fall behind. Leave communications technology. Let's just talk about batteries and let's talk about um, uh, any kind of uh, environmentally uh, sustainable energy. Other countries have much more investment in those kinds of infrastructure than the United States is. And so if you wanna buy uh, a car that is an electric car now, you're gonna be using parts that are made in other countries that are underwritten by their governments. So if you just take it as a national security uh, concern, we're gonna have a competitive disadvantage from the failures to invest in public infrastructure. Thank you, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, we have uh, several people in the, in the chat who want to talk about Twitter and Elon Musk, and I'm going to read these two questions. Uh, one is from Nancy Weaver, who asks, is Elon Musk's assessment of Twitter as our new town square accurate? And if so, what do you think about his offer to purchase? And the other question from Joseph Benson is a question on the current news item of Elon Musk attempted by Twitter. One reason I've heard many of his supporters give for desiring his ownership of the platform is that it um, is Musk's approach to free speech would be more libertarian than its current ownership. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on this situation? Is there a good way to handle Musk's bid to own Twitter? And that's a good opportunity for you to talk about the uh, uh, libertarian weaponization uh, of, the, of the First Amendment that you go into in, uh, in some depth in the book. So a two-part question, one just about the notion of, of Twitter as a, as a town square, and then this other one about the libertarian issues. You know, I think that some of the biggest users of Twitter in this country are journalists. Um, all the journalists I know use Twitter to find out what's going on. Um, I don't know if uh, the vast public uses Twitter, so I'd be reluctant to call it uh, a public square. Um, for that reason. Um, uh, in, in certain circles, it's very, very common, but in others, it's not. Uh, TikTok, a little bit more uh, dominant, I think. Um, and also, you know, the platforms, uh, gaming platforms, which have much larger users than any of the conventional media and have their own messaging boards, um, which are uh, outside of public view uh, altogether. Um, Twitter is a very fascinating phenomenon. The, they've had a toxic culture at Twitter um, and their own uh, corporate board governance has been broken for a long time. Put aside their content or their uh, uh, what it is that they actually promote in their services, just that that's been a problem uh, in the board in general. 
Uh, and people that I know who have served on the board have said they have corporate governance problems. Um, so I'm actually d disappointed that someone like Elon Musk is not going on the board to straighten that out. Um, buying the company, uh, you know, depends what he's going to do with it. I have no idea what he would do with it. The idea that he would eliminate uh, editing uh, is unimaginable. The vast majority of moderated uh, activity on Twitter and on any of the platforms is to eliminate spam. Y you have to have moderation. There has to be moderation. There will be moderation. So the only question is along what lines. Another related question is when you're using machine learning tools to do the moderation, which everybody has to do because the scale is so monumental, is what level of error do people accept? And that is something that is worthy of discussion. I'm not singling out uh, Twitter. I think it's an issue for all of the platforms. And I just myself believe that if you look at the choices from the selection of the data sets on which the machine learning is taught to the level of error that's accepted to the level of feedback and accounting that is used to then feed back into the system to modify the data sets. All of that, those are choices that the company should actually be exercising much more responsible action over it, and much more valuable than say, let's make the algorithms transparent. No, only the people at MIT will understand the algorithms. That's not what needs to be made transparent. It's these choices that are made by human beings that are not made by, um, uh, by, uh, by computers. Um, I think that uh, the libertarian idea about the first amendment is very confusing because on the one hand, it suggests no regulation. And as I've already indicated, there's always regulation. In conventional media, there's editing. Uh, in internet the platforms, there's editing. There's always editing. Um, there was a, a golden age in some ways of the internet that was fueled by a kind of libertarian ideology that claimed this is the new free space. We don't need a government. Well, guess what? Not true. Um, uh, my, my colleague, Jack uh, Goldsmith, wrote a very important book about how the internet depends and internet companies depend more on conventional laws uh, than other companies do and turn to those laws to enforce their practices. They're not libertarian. It's a question about what policies you want or don't want. Um, and uh, which is in fact always the case. There is no freedom without some kind of control. There is no private property without some kind of rules. The question is, what are the rules? When I call a certain direction in Supreme Court jurisprudence, libertarian First Amendment, what I mean is that there's a kind of um, uh, ruthless hatchet uh, being taken to any governmental regulation on the grounds that it's speech. And once we say it's speech, the First Amendment prohibits government regulation. It's kind of a mindless, as I say, hatchet or weapon. Um, and it's bringing back what some people are calling it the new Lochner. Well, Lochner was a decision made by the Supreme Court in the early part of the 20th century, didn't use the First Amendment, used the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, but had the same effect creating the power of five justices, the majority of the Supreme Court, to strike down democratically enacted laws on the grounds that it interfered with freedom. In that case, it was freedom of contract or the property rights of employers. And using that theory, the Supreme Court struck down wages and hours like uh, legislation, any kind of workplace regulation, rules about unions. Same thing happened then when the New Deal started the first three years of the New Deal. The five members of the Supreme Court struck down the New Deal saying it violates freedom of contract, private property. In both instances, the country rebelled. The country said, this is a disaster. We need health and safety regulations. And after the depression, we need a New Deal that's gonna actually regulate the economy. And I, suspect that will happen with this new Lochner, the use of the First Amendment to strike down uh, Federal Trade Commission action, antitrust action, uh, because it goes too far. But in the meantime, there's a lot of damage 
uh, that is occurring with the Supreme Court, you know, striking down all kinds of laws saying that it's speech. And look, we have lower courts that have said anything on the internet is speech, even if it's a sale. Uh, and initially, internet companies said that's why sex trafficking cannot be regulated because it's just speech on the internet. Congress actually rejected that and agreed to amend Section 230 so that there's a carve out for sex trafficking on internet platforms. It's about political will. Mm. Um, well, I think maybe we could end on that extremely powerful note. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Martha, you. You know, for, for joining us and for uh, just un unpacking all of these really complicated and interesting and important, vitally important issues that you raise in this new book. Um, it was just great to be able to talk with you about it today. And thank you um, to our graduate students and all of our participants who showed up too as well and for the, the questions that you sent us via chat. Um, I will just end by saying that we have just one more colloquium, uh, public colloquium event uh, this semester, which is on May 5th. We're having Fred Turner from Stanford uh, out here in person with Mary Beth Meehan coming in from uh, Providence to talk about their book, Seeing Silicon Valley. Um, so it's a it's it's a book of photos with with um, a text by by Fred Turner and um, I have a discount code if anyone wants to buy for thirty percent off um, as well from University of, I think it's, yeah University of Chicago Press so feel free to drop me an email if you didn't um, if you weren't on that list where I sent out the discount code but I am I'm hoping to see many of you there uh, in person it's it's in person for MIT community and via Zoom from those outside of MIT so um, see many of you there I hope and um, a good night to everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great questions. Thank you.